good morning good afternoon good evening depending upon where you are on this globe i am madan rehani president international organization for medical physics i'll be introducing the moderator and then moderator will continue with the process of the webinar happy international medical physics week to all of you and i welcome you on behalf of iump some logistic points please use only q and a for question and answers as questions and answers may get mixed up with so much chat so please do not put your question and answer in the chat box please use chat sparingly because it creates distractions for the many other people we will record the talks and recorded talks are made available within 24 hour on the iump website as informed we provide certificate of participation and this will be done the week following this week of the iump w iump w so with that i will uh, start with the introduction introduction of the moderator for today who is dr pedro was he is a radiation protection expert with special interest in computational dosimetry he works at the center for nuclear science and technology of ist in portugal where he coordinates research and he was president of the center for nuclear sciences and technology from 2017 to 20 he is or has been the representative of portugal in several committees of european union he is the institutional representative in european union research platforms such as melody and eurodos he served as the NLO the national liaison officer of portugal for the iaa he is a member of the editorial board for european journal of radiology and associate editor for the journal of radiation physics and chemistry he teaches radiation protection and dosimetry topics in different portuguese universities with those few words i will pass on to pedro please with the start of the introduction of speakers andrew please hello dear colleagues uh, greetings from from portugal and uh, madan thank you very much for for your kind introduction it's uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to moderate this webinar today and i have the privilege to introduce two top level experts that i'm introducing following uh the first speaker is is Dr. Shunsi Kli is a senior researcher uh, and investigator at the Dosimetry Unit at at the National Cancer Institute of the United States has more than 20 years uh, of expertise on computational and experimental radiation dosimetry for patients undergoing medical radiation procedures his research team develops methods and tools to estimate radiation dose from medical exposures and dosimetry to generate reliable dose data for use in epidemiological studies of ionizing radiation and uh, and cancer risk he has been involved in several task groups uh, in the icrp during the recent years and was appointed to icrp committee to doses from radiation exposure dr lee will address uh, current status and challenges in organ dose estimation for patients undergoing diagnostic radiology procedures following Uh, there is uh, dr manuel bardies he has developed uh, research in uh, radio pharmaceutical dosimetry within insern the national institute of uh, health and medical research in 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 france since 1992 in in nantes and then in toulouse and is currently in uh, montpellier starting uh, 2021 he was a member of the european association for nuclear medicine dosimetry committee from 2001 through 2013 and he has been the chair from 2009 to 2011 he has chaired the ifom science committee from 2014 to 2016 and is currently chairing the ifom 
special interest group for uh, radionuclide internal dosimetry. He has been involved uh, in education in various uh, European programs, ESMIT and ESMIT, and he is a member of the board of the Medical Physics Resident Program in France. The group that uh, he is leading is involved in uh, radiopharmaceutical dosimetry at uh, various scales, so tissue and organ. He's also involved in Monte Carlo modeling of radiation transport. The objective is to improve uh, molecular radiotherapy by allowing uh, patient-specific treatments. Dr. Bardiez will be speaking about clinical dosimetry in diagnostic and therapy, recent developments, and new perspectives. Having said this, I just stop sharing and I ask Dr. Schulzikli to start this presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Chairman. <clears throat> and thank you, Dr. Rahimi, so for inviting me to this um, webinar series. It's a great privilege. So I'm going to talk about uh, these topics, background, uh, current status of uh, method, and remaining challenges, and I'm going to summarize the talk. Um, you must be familiar with this pie chart, NCRP 2009. Uh, they introduced and uh, this report reported the distribution of um, per capita effective dose. And we found that medical radiation covers more than 50% uh, of effective dose. Uh, more recent report in 2019, they found very similar. Uh, there is not much change in the contribution from medical radiation. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to cover the symmetry method in this order. So first, computer tomography, and second, nuclear medicine, and third, radiography and fluoroscopy. And remaining challenges in the symmetry uh, method. So uh, several different dose descriptors are available for these modalities, CT, for example, CTDI, DLP, SSD, et cetera. These are available, but these are not patient dose. Um, and most of the, most of the, uh, the measurements are uh, available from this phantom, not patient. So there's some confusion, but they're not critical, uh, not definitely uh, patient absorbed dose. So why organ dose? So risk estimation requires organ specific dose and most uh, essential dosimetric quantity in uh, epidemiological studies is organ dose, not effective dose or CTDI. And these are also required for procedure optimization, uh, such as the, even though same CTDI ball and different organ dose received uh, for different uh, procedures. And organ dose is most efficient uh, communication uh, with risk to patient uh, instead of CTDI or other dose descriptors. So that is why organ dose is important. Um, so I'm going to go over current status of the symmetry method also uh, focus on the dosimetry method and tools uh, my team has developed in the past years. The first CT. CT dosimetry for uh, uh, CT patients are really based on this uh, algorithm. Um, so organ dose can be calculated, actually derived from CTDI ball. So when you convert CTDI ball to organ dose, uh, to do that, you're going to need organ dose conversion coefficient. So most of the existing tools out there are uh, from this organ dose conversion coefficient. Uh, interestingly, though, when you have three scanners, they have different organ dose and different CTDI ball. But when you normalize organ dose by CTDI ball, you're going to get very similar uh, quantity, which is called organ dose conversion coefficient. So there are tools like uh, all different tools and commercial tools out there. They're basically based on this particular algorithm. And uh, the major difference is uh, the phantom uh, included in the, in the code and uh, some old stylized phantom. And most, more recently, they use voxel or hybrid, more realistic phantoms. 
Uh, in my uh, research team, we have developed NCI CT, uh, starting from NCI CT one and two and three in different version, uh, different type of phantoms were involved, reference size phantom and non-reference size phantom, body site dependent phantom, and pregnant and fetus phantoms. And they have been uh, experimentally validated in different, uh, different papers. Uh, these are important tools because first, uh, body site dependent effect is huge. And when you compare reference size versus body size dependent phantoms, and when you just ignore body size, when you calculate CT dose, uh, when you have obese patient, you tend to uh, overestimate uh, those organ doses. When you have skinny patient, when you ignore body size, you tend to have uh, uh, underestimation of skinny patient dose. Another benefit of this tool, uh, you're gonna have fetal organ dose, which is, uh, was not available before in the previous versions. And when you, this is comparison between uh, uterus dose. So uterus dose has to be used if you don't have fetal model. And compared to uterus dose as a surrogate, actual fetal organ dose might be different this much in uh, abdominal pelvis scan. So this is another importance of uh, explicit fetal, fetal model into your uh, CT dosimetry. Moving on to uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, this is the basic algorithm of nuclear medicine dose calculator, starting from specific observed fraction. And when you add uh, energy spectrum of different radionuclei, so you're gonna come to uh, S values. And when you, assign biokinetic data, which is distribution of uh, radionuclides in your body, and you're gonna be able to calculate organ dose. Okay, so these are not told. Sorry, <laughs> there's some uh, recording it's there. So existing tools uh, are there, but this is uh, our tool. We, we have been uh, developing to improve uh, the existing problems in other tools. So we have implemented uh, recently adopted ICRP uh, reference pediatric and adult phantoms. And in this tool, we also uh, included almost 300 uh, radionuclides uh, spectrum and also for different uh, radiopharmaceuticals, over 100 uh, radiopharmaceuticals when you select it the biokinetic model uh, distribution will be automatically populated and you're gonna have uh, organ dose on, on right panel. These are the list of uh, source regions in NCI-NM and these are the list of target region, almost 55 target regions available in NCI-NM. Um, this is quick comparison between, cause NCI-NM has two phantom sets available, NCI phantom and ICRP phantom. And we compare to each other self-absorption. They are pretty much the, very similar. Crossfire, they are completely different phantom. So you can expect some difference up to you know, 400%. Um, so in moving on to radiography and fluoroscopy, there, this is a basic um, uh, algorithm. The first approach is pre-calculated lookup table. So you calculate all different scenarios uh, over and over, and you can apply pre-calculated lookup table uh, to your scenario. Second option is Monte Carlo, explicit Monte Carlo radiation transport. So lookup table fast, but impossible to cover various scenarios, especially innovation of floral. Uh, Monte Carlo, slow, but it can uh, cover various scenarios. So these are the existing tools out there. Some tool uh, based on lookup table and other tools, expli explicit um, Monte Carlo calculation. So our team has developed uh, called the radiation 
those calculator called NCIRF. And this is based on the Gen 4 Monte Carlo engine uh, streamlined. So you can select all different parameters and phantom and click a button and then you can run explicit Monte Carlo calculation in the background. Um, and you can also uh, select number of thread in this tool, uh, depending on your, uh, your PC's capacity. And that way you can uh, speed up the calculation. This is a, a Gen 4 different module and we cross out some modules to speed up the calculation. And this is a validation when we uh, uh, did quick, very simplified geometry, we compare Gen 4 with uh, gold standard MCMP calculation. We observe very good agreement between two codes. Uh, and this is Monte Carlo calculation time for uh, 10 million. And when you use 10 million, you can uh, decrease Monte Carlo error uh, for in-field less than 1% and out-of-field less than 10%. And to do that, when you use, when you increase number of thread, calculate time uh, very reasonable, less than two minutes. This is another test between PCXMC and uh, NCIRF. When you do abdominal uh, PA between two code, PCXMC also has uh, a, a feature to adjust body size. You can uh, calculate uh, obese patients, skinny patients. Uh, we found that PCXMC calculation uh, overestimates uh, the re more realistic uh, phantom in NCIRF. Okay, so here are the uh, remaining challenges in uh, to submit uh, the uh, those calculation for radiology uh, patients. First, there are still difference between phantom and patient. So CT or, or nuclear medicine uh, surrogate model is required for pre-calculation, especially the nuclear medicine. Little is known for body size effect. So, and radiation, uh, radiography and fluoroscopy, there's no patient images available. So even though you use phantom, and there's still uh, error, potential errors between phantom and patient. Uh, even though you individualize phantom by age, gender, body size, pregnancy, there is still uh, a difference between those phantom anatomy versus patient. Um, so to overcome, uh, people are developing automatic segmentation method for CT and nuclear medicine and fast Monte Carlo calculation for CT and nuclear medicine. These are really potential solution for this dosmetric error in the future. This is quick comparison between NCI CT uh, versus actual patient. So even though NCI CT can mimic different body size, there is still limitation and difference between those two. Um, I, can, I can skip this. So, and, and there's still technical difficulties uh, in different modality, uh, simulation of different modalities, CT, tube current modulation, algorithm is not really clear. Uh, some vendors clear, not clear for some vendors, still challenging uh, to, potential modulation and dual energy, these emerging technique uh, is still on in progress uh, in terms of those calculation uh, methods. And normalized that CTDI database are still limited for new scanners. Uh, nuclear medicine, the biokinetic model, mostly based on the radiation protection purpose. So they ICRP reference biokinetic versus actual patient specific biokinetic there huge variation and difference. Uh, to re, uh, derive residence time for from images, pet or spec, uh, there's still manual work required and there are technical difficulties there still. Radiography and fluoroscopy uh, interface between uh, radiation, those structure report versus these radiation calculation tool are not available and some Missing parameters has to be assumed, such as beam isocenter within phantom. So these are the uh, remaining technical difficulties in those calculations. 
And how about uh, use of effective dose in medical radiation? Uh, as you know, the effective dose is originally designed for radiation protection, uh, but they've been used for many different uh, purposes uh, in uh, radi uh, medical radiation. So it's not tailored for specific disease endpoint. So ICRP, it, it varies depending on different parameters such as ICRP tissue rating factors and surrogate anatomy, uh, which surrogate anatomy was used for uh, conversion factors. So there's still huge variation depending on different method, deriving method in effective dose. Okay, so I wanna summarize uh, my talk. And uh, so there are substantial contribution from medical exposure to per capita uh, effective dose uh, worldwide. Um, organ dose estimation method actively developed so far and available for CT, nuclear medicine, and floral. Remaining dose metric errors come from uh, phantom versus patient difference and technical difficulties and huge variation in effective dose variation. Uh, I want to summarize this with quick uh, uh, information. These tools are developed at NCI, available for free for research purpose from the website. Um, this is an one example. Recently uh, in Brazil, there was a, a radiation dose course and NCICT was used very uh, useful for educational purpose. Uh, in this course. Thank you for your attention. This wrapping up my um, my talk. So, <clears throat> hello everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I would like first to thank the organizer for the invitation. I'm actually completely stunned to see that we have up to almost 700 participants. Uh, so that's an incredible amount of people for a very, very narrow topic. So thank you so much for the organization and thanks for the invitation. So as we know, nuclear medicine is mostly a diagnostic specialty. So the number of a percentage of 90% can be debated, obviously it depends on the country and it's, it may be varying, but it gives a rough idea. So nuclear medicine is mostly diagnostic. So in that context, dosimetry is mostly required before getting marketing authorization. And you can have some, and <laughs> thanks for almost the introduction from the previous speaker, because uh, yes, we can have uh, reference dosimetry, absorbed dose estimates for in MERD dose estimate report or in ICRP reports like high ICRP report 128. And that is based, as was said, with, on um, a specific absorbed fraction and S values. Then for the therapeutic application of nuclear medicine, we can see first that we have a problem with nomenclature. So some call it a targeted internal radiotherapy, molecular radiotherapy, selective internal radiotherapy when it's with microspheres. And you can see here all the specialties depending on the target, depending on the vector that is being used. The only thing that we have to remember is it's growing. And with introduction of new radiopharmaceutical, it will carry on growing. The number of indication and the number of patients that can benefit from the treatment is increasing in the whole world. Then when we're coming back to dosimetry, the question of therapy versus diagnostics, the goals are not the same. For diagnostic, we want to have usually reference dosimetry and estimate is okay. But for therapy, especially if we are thinking of interventional procedure, we really need to be as accurate as possible. I'm just listing here the different reasons why dosimetry could be implemented in therapy. I would say by order of interest. So you may want to just document what you're doing for, to compare different centers. Maybe it's just a legal requirement to document what you're doing. Then because we have drugs that are more and more efficient, the patient sometimes can come back years after for another disease that requires treating with ionizing radiation, in which case the first thing will uh, the radiation oncologist will ask is the absorbed dose delivered during his first treatment with nuclear medicine. So it's something that we should be ready to document. 
And then obviously intervention on procedures. So that's, I would say, the holy grail of the cl uh, clinical dosimetry in therapy, where the activity will be assessed, will be quantified, will be calculated as a function of a patient-specific uptake of a drug. So we really go in direction of patient-specific therapy. And the dosimetry procedure obviously depends on the objective. So if we see the reference, uh, so the MERT scheme, so D equal AS, so I assume everybody knows uh, that approach. So for each target that uptakes the radiopharmaceutical, you first have to identify the sources where the ionizing radiation, where the radioactive sources are. You have to get the number of disintegration, so that's accumulated activity, or the residence time in all the sources, get the relevant S value that give the absorbed dose in a given target per decay in a source, sum all contributions, and software like OLIDA or IDAC that were already presented uh, can do that for you. So this is model-based dosimetry. This also can be called reference dosimetry when people are using uh, reference phantoms that everybody agree on, and that's to be able to compare different procedure or different radiopharmaceutical on the same basis. Then patient-specific dosimetry, we still are going to use, the, at least in the beginning, the, the MERD formalism, uh, even though it was designed for diagnostics. Uh, the problem was that absorbed dose was quite difficult, and so having S values that were pre-computed in tables was quite uh, handy. But then in, in therapy, we aim for patient-specific dosimetry, and so now it's mostly image-based. So as a very rough summary, and you can see how easy the graph is, if you're going for model-based dosimetry, you will have something very fast. It may not be very accurate though, but then if you want to go to patient-specific dosimetry or image-based dosimetry, then your accuracy is likely to improve. But then there's a penalty in, time, in terms of time it takes to process or to get the results. In fact, when you think of it, there's a whole clinical dosimetry workflow. So what I call clinical dosimetry workflow is the chain of steps, the sequence of steps that have to be done from calibration to patient acquisition, activity determination, registration, segmentation, time activity coefficient, cumulated activity assessment, absorbed dose calculation, and presentation of the results. So you see, when we're thinking of D equal AS, uh, we just considering a part of the clinical dosimetry workflow. And obviously all steps have to be treated with the same care. So we're going to go through them but very quickly because we have no time. Calibration. Calibration is essential as everybody know. It has to be consistent with a clinical procedure. You cannot do calibration on one hand and then change gamma camera to do your patient acquisition. It's usually not standardized and it's a very, I mean, it's a big concern because that conditions everything. So the very basic calibration is you give me a point source and then I do the rest. So that's the approach for the people who are mastering all the corrections. Then what is usually done in practical environment is to use a phantom that mimics a given clinical condition, uh, situation. Here, for example, you have uh, something that mimics a kidney in a case, and that's for peptide therapy with lutetium-177, because the kidney is the organ at risk. So you have a cylinder here to the right that uh, is representing a, a pseudo kidney. And then you have to do the validation, obviously, because otherwise it's uh, not working. And I have to stress here the efforts of uh, metrology and the, the fact that many more uh, metrology national laboratories are interested in targeted internal radiotherapy and they're doing if, uh, making efforts in that respect. So the, the CCRI, Radionuclide Therapy and Quantitative Imaging Working Group, that is currently chaired by Brian Zimmerman, is actually doing a lot of work in, in, in that respect. So then, uh, conclusion for this part is that you really have to associate and to do acquisition for calibration and patient in the same way. It's essential for traceability and reproducibility. And so that's also acknowledged in that paper. Reconstruction, I'm not going to discuss much. It's there, it's available, it's usually sold with your gamma camera, or it can be acquired as a different workstation, like, you know, and the uh, 
constructor and dependent like Mim, Hermes, or others. Uh, and there are some references about how to do reconstruction and quantification. Then it's interesting to that because it's a sequence in time, because you want to have a time activity curve, then you have to implement segmentation, delineate the region you're interested in, and registration, because your patient may have moved from one time to another one. And these two steps are not independent in the sense that depending on the software, the registration precedes the segmentation or vice versa, or you may have to select one reference frame on which you do your segmentation, etc., etc. So that's why I put them together, registration and segmentation in that step. But they may not be one unique way to do it. Time activity curve fitting. Well, it's highly dependent on time sampling, as we know. And basically, when you look at the different algorithm, there are the way uh, the area under the curve is obtained for the time point, so between the first time point and to the last time point of acquisition, what I call interpolation. And then a major impact is that of what happens between time zero and first time point and what happens after the last time point, which is the extrapolation. And the way it's been treated varies a lot depending on the uh, al uh, algorithm and codes, and that has an impact. Absorb those calculation, amazingly, at least because I spent most of my career on this, I thought it was complicated. It probably may not be the hardest part, in fact, especially those days. Uh, you have different algorithm, and this is a, a, a tree for selection that I'm proposing. Depending on the geometry and radiation characteristic, if you have non-penetrating radiation, then you can use local energy deposition algorithm. So no radiation transport at all. Then if not, then in, if you are in a homogeneous medium, then convolution is your friend. If not, then you are implementing or you have to implement Monte Carlo modeling to get your absorbed dose. And at the end of that, it's very important to see that your work is not finished at the calculation of the absorbed dose. You may want to have some radiobiology parameters like the VED. You want to compute dose volume histogram. You have dosimetry related indices like, you know, maximum absorbed dose in that volume, minimum absorbed dose in that volume, and so on. And that depends on the, the clinical situation. And when it's not, when it's done, it's not finished. There's a way you have to report dosimetry, as is made here. So it's in French, but you, you see the point. To the left, that is what the physicist keeps. So you have a lot of information, like the kind of fitting you've had, the algorithm for absorbed dose calculation, etc. To the right, you have the absorbed dose indices that are given to the clinician. And that's an integral part of a clinical dosimetry workflow. Then some comment about the patient-specific dosimetry and the D equal AS. In fact, when you are addressing clinical dosimetry uh, based on image, uh, in fact, you don't need S values anymore because you're doing your calculation once and for all for your patient. So it's not reference dosimetry. It's specific dosimetry done on purpose. But furthermore, you may not need the accumulated activity that is the total number of decay. And this is uh, the sequence which is normally used. Uh, you, you, you start from activity, you integrate in time to have accumulated activity, and then you compute the absorbed doses. And that was done mostly in a time where dosimetry was so long was so long to get and difficult that you couldn't do anything else. These days, you tend to have from every time that is acquired, you compute the absorbed dose rate because you know that that has an impact in therapy on the effect. And then and only then do you integrate to get the absorbed doses. So it's, a, it's another way where you don't use cumulated activity. Software. You have software, uh, academic, commercial, and there's a lot of question about software, but it's coming. And the issue is how to benchmark, how to compare this software, especially because in the clinical dosimetry workflow, you can see that some of the software, not all of them, right? But you can see, uh, obviously, that they're not doing the same thing. They're not addressing the same part of a clinical dosimetry workflow. So it's very difficult to compare. You have here a paper that was uh, recently published where you have the different uh, features that one can look for or get in a clinical dosimetry software. So obviously it's a snapshot. It's likely to evolve in time. And so how to compare software? 
because they're not addressing the same parts of the clinical dosimetry workflow, we have first to define new metrics to benchmark clinical dosimetry. So it's not just about absorbed doses or mean absorbed doses. You may want to have different indices, different index to do the comparison. So you have also to define checkpoints in clinical dosimetry where you want to compare, for example, volumes or counts or activity or et cetera, et cetera. And for this, you may want to design virtual patient that will allow you to test the, the whole clinical dosimetry workflow as if it was a real patient. Or conversely, you may want to define specific objects to test a given part of uh, the procedure. Like you can define an object for absorbed dose calculation validation or quantification validation. And that's not the same objects. So as a takeaway message, uh, we really have to document what we're doing because that allows traceability. And we should try to assess uncertainties as much as possible. And that is basically in starting quality assurance in clinical dosimetry in nuclear medicine as is currently implemented in external beam radiotherapy. So this is the way, I mean, they show us the way. So as a conclusion, um, patient-specific dosimetry requires all steps to be patient-specific. There are codes, academic or commercial, that are available in the clinics. We really need to develop quality assurance in clinical dosimetry. I think that's the next frontier. And it's fastly, you know, it's evolving fast, so you have to stay tuned. And I bring, uh, since I have an opportunity to speak in front of the very large audience, I really want to highlight the fact that EFORM has created a special interest group on radionuclide dosimetry. And that group is open to everyone in the world, not only uh, European, because you can be a form accept now individual associate members. So all of you, I mean, the 700 or more uh, that are present, you can possibly join the special interest group if you are interested. And with that, I, I thank you. Thank you very much to Dr. Lee and Dr. Bardiez for these very enlightening uh, presentations. Lots of data has been uh, provided to the, to the attendees. And so uh, I think that we have now a reasonable amount of time, more than 20 minutes to Q's and A's. And uh, I see here in the panel several interesting questions uh, to both speakers. I don't know if Madan, if you want to to, to, to comment yourself on, on some of them, but, but uh, w one of the, the questions that I, I see is, uh, in the meantime, they were answered, uh, is from Yos Yoshiyuki Segawa. And uh, I don't know who wants to answer this one, either Chunsik or Manuel. Why does ICRP recommend the use of effective dose in medical exposure instead of organ dose? I am not even sure that this statement is correct, but uh, do you want to comment on this? Both of you? I think Professor Lee has already answered uh, partly. Yeah, I try to answer a little bit. Uh, yeah, this is very, yeah, it's not 100% clear, right? The HIP is really recommending effective dose for those comparison uh, tool across the different modalities. And uh, it is clear that uh, organ dose, organ mm -hmm. absorbed dose is really recommended for risk analysis purpose. So they do have different purposes, I think. Okay. There is a, another- Maybe I can yes, please. add something very quickly. As, as, as a physicist working in nuclear medicine and because we have hybrid machines, it's somehow a little bothering to me when uh, I'm faced with, you know, what is more irradiating? Is it a CT or is it a radiopharmaceutical? And okay, okay we, we know that, but uh, how do you explain to someone that uh, on one hand you've got activity and on the other hand, you've got CTDI. So we need to have a sort of common ground, which I perfectly understand is not meant for a given individual, but we need to have a common ground to compare different modalities and nuclear medicine is probably, because it's by a sense now multimodal, uh, the discipline where effective dose is actually needed um, just for us scientists, if you maybe, but uh, I think it's very useful. Okay. Maybe, so maybe I, have, I can add. Yes. Maybe I can add. 
Uh, see, there is no other way but to use some quantity which uh, one can convey the meaning to the practitioners when different modalities are involved. Like Manuel mentioned, nuclear medicine and uh, uh, X-ray imaging. And then different parts of the body when they are involved. So organ doses will be dozens of uh, the values. So, and also when there is a recurrent imaging, so cumulate, one has to cumulate. So there are situations where there is no other way but to use effective dose. Till the time something better comes out, whatever be the limitations of effective dose, that is uh, the only way to use it. There was a task group of ICRP uh, to develop dose quantities and they, they thought that uh, uh, till the time a patient specific dose uh, is developed, uh, we should accept the use of effective dose in medical examination. So there is a new task group which is now working on patient-specific dose or patient-specific uh, um, detriment of the dose. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for the clarification. I have a batch of questions to, to Chunsik concerning the, the availability of uh, NCI uh, software. Is, uh, one of them is from uh, E. Uh, is the CT dose calculation tool open source? Maybe you can take the next also. Does the NCI those programs already get data from DICO? Yeah, I try to answer there. And then those all tools, NCI, including NCI Bantams, NCI CT, NM, RF, uh, they are all available from ncidose.cancer.gov. ncidose.cancer.gov. So when you go there, you can submit the uh, uh, agreement form uh, very quick and then you can get the uh, uh, execution file, execution version of this software, and then the, uh, we don't release source code to to uh, research purpose right now. Um, and NCI those tool versus DICOM interface, we are working on uh, NCI RF, NCI NCI CT right now uh, to extract the data from radiation structure report. Right now, and likely to be included in the next version. But the thing is, uh, there are some vendors out there who's using NCI tools in their um, those monitoring tools right now. So in that case, commercially available uh, those those, those interfaces. But for research purpose, free version, it is not uh, is not yet available. And did I answer all the questions? Yeah. I see. You, you have still some of them, but I, I will switch now to Manuel just to allow you to relax a little bit. Uh, from Anonymous, uh, dear Professor Bardiez, what is your opinion about single time point dosimetry? Is it only uh, so, useful for organ dosimetry, like kidney, for instance? So, um, so I, I've got very mixed feelings about this. Think of uh, selective internal radiotherapy because you assume that the radioactive uh, yttrium 90 sources, microspheres, they stay where, where they are when they are administered. So you base your dosimetry on a one time point image and sometimes it's voxel based and uh, because you rely on acquisition that can be made using PET for uh, positrons that are emitted in by yttrium 90, even though there's not a lot of them per decay. Um, and then you, you end up with a voxel-based dosimetry that's uh, coming from a single time point. So we have to be careful. I mean, in, in that question, I think I'll see two questions. One is voxel-based versus organ-based dosimetry. And the other one, that's the main question, is one time point versus many time points. So organ-based versus voxel-based dosimetry. In my knowledge, voxel-based dosimetry has not proven superior in therapeutic nuclear medicine so far. Even though there have been some paper, one paper some years ago by Uni Dewaraja uh, on iodine-131, 
for tumor dosimetry, but the problem is that the, the, the let's say the statistical correlation was quite faint. It was there, but not you know striking. And uh, my good colleague Carlo Chiesa is working a lot in selective internal radiotherapy and is trying to demonstrate the, the power of voxel-based dosimetry. And at the moment, it's difficult. It doesn't do it. Then one time point versus several time points. The concern is usually to decrease the time needed to do dosimetry. So you don't want to put a patient 10 times under the gamma camera, and that's perfectly understandable. Then the real question is, because it's going to vary depending on the radiopharmaceutical, the pathology, the disease, the patient, ultimately. So the number of time points may vary. There's not a single answer to all this. So basically, and that's what I wrote, you have what you pay for. If you only have one time point, then you may have a rough estimate. You'll have an absorbed dose rate that you can complement with external counting, for example, to try to integrate in time. That is likely to be quite variable, inaccurate, if you wish. But maybe it's better than nothing. So I, I, I'd rather leave that question open and say uh, what my good friend Gerhard Glatting from Germany said once, in fact, we physicists should ask the MD, what level of accuracy do you want? And then as a function of your answer, we will implement a clinical dosimetry protocol. If you want a real a rough estimate, then we can do a fast and dirty thing. If you really want to be accurate because you need it in your clinical practice, then it's gonna cost you in terms of time, in terms of acquisition and processing, etc. But ultimately, the clinician decides on the accuracy that he or she desires. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this for Chunsik. How do you handle traces not in ICRP 128, for instance, in NCI and M? And how do you handle different pharmacokinetic? Yes, yeah, from Gerd so Luthers. Right, right now, biokinetic of NCI and M is heavily relies on ICRP uh, report. We did uh, 53 and uh, up to 128, but uh, if anything is out of this report, I, I don't have any other data set to in incorporate into, so. Okay. Manuel, uh, great presentation. This is from Anonymous. Can you see a future for clinical microdosimetry in molecular radiotherapy, particularly for radiobiological considerations of alpha emitters, for instance? So, well, uh, clinical on one hand and microdosimetry on the other hand, it's very difficult to associate. Uh, especially if you think of microdosimetry as not uh, dosimetry at the microscopic scale, but as real microdosimetry, which is uh, documenting the, the stochastic nature of energy deposition. So microdosimetry for alpha emitters has proven very interesting, but mostly in a preclinical context for cellular studies, mm -hmm. uh, where, I mean, some authors have been working on that. And I think it's very good in terms of documentation of uh, how variable can the irradiation and energy deposition can be. Uh, and also if, and that's where the alpha emitter can sin, can, comes in, if only uh, a single energy deposition, as is the case for alpha, can uh, kill a cell, or if you don't need so many track in a, um, intersection in your cell to kill it, then you really have to document the statistic nature of irradiation. Conversely for beta, if you need thousands of interaction before your, your cell is killed, then you are in a domain where the average energy deposited is likely to be the relevant parameter. Then for clinical dosimetry, as I said, we have voxel that are what? Four, five, six millimeter side. So that's huge for uh, micro dosimetry, right? And, and even the, the, the special uh, resolution is even worse than that. We expect, we know that we, we cannot uh, get the activity with better than one centimeter. 
So what we have is an average activity in a cube of one centimeter. So you see it's um, at that scale, most radiation used in therapy, especially alpha, are non-penetrating radiation. What you have is just an average, I mean, it's the world of average. You have average activity, average energy deposition, an average mass. So it's very, very far from uh, micro dosimetry. I'm not saying it's not interesting. I'm just saying that it's uh, probably not uh, possible to implement at the clinical scale. Thank you very much. I, there are several questions. I, I allow myself um, one of them and I will join my question with another question with, that is in the Q and A. It's, it's related and I, I, I would ask both experts to comment on this. It's related to the uncertainties and to, to some aspect that you, you also mentioned both in your presentation is related to the, to the, to the need to undertake uh, appropriate benchmarking of, of, of the code. So uh, there is, uh, I go now for the, for, the, for the question that is on the Q&A. How accurate should a medical physicist calculation of patient doses be for patient undergoing diagnostic nuclear medicine or diagnostic radiology? including cardiology catheterization lab studies? This is, I think, a, a very relevant question. And maybe I, I would ask you both to, to comment. And, and to provide your views, by the way, I mean, how do you see, considering the, the, the existing level of accuracy, how do you see it in, let's say, in a one year, three years, five years time, something like that? Yes, please, who yeah. wants to take the lead? <laughs> Manuel, you want to do that as a clinical physicist <laughs> first? Manuel. Okay. Um, as, as a physicist, I was asked to work in, in therapy. And then uh, years after, I had to work in diagnostic. And obviously, uh, I, at first, I didn't consider it, you know, very attractive because it's not patient-specific. It's uh, based on model and etc. And then I realized the amount of excellent science that is behind it. And that also helped me a lot to reconsider the way I was doing dosimetry in therapy. So the answer, my answer to this is the accuracy depends on the question. If you're doing reference dosimetry, you know, I'm going to be provocative here, but if you're doing reference dosimetry, if you really want to compare two radiopharmaceuticals on the same basis, somehow it doesn't really matter how accurate the model is. What really matters is that the model, the reference model is accepted everywhere. And then something that I could observe is that quite often because the radiation safety institutions are also the one who are participating in ICRP and to provide references, so they have both things. So, and that was nicely illustrated in the, the talk before mine, because you not only have one reference, you have now families of patients. You have large patients, you have skinny patients, because you go a little further and you want to see how variable these estimates are, depending on the geometry of a patient. But in fact, if you really want to have one reference, you don't need to vary the models. When I see the different teams having, let's say, an Indian reference person or uh, Iranian, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's such a huge difference in human anatomy, but what I know is that if we are using different phantoms, different models, it's going to be very difficult to compare our results. So it depends, the, the answer to that question, how accurate, depends on the question. How accurate do you want to be? If you really want to be accurate, because you want to have an answer, then you have to go for patient-specific, full patient-specific. If you're using a model, then the question is how universal do you want to, the model to be? How a reference, how much of a reference do you want the model to be? Yeah, and yeah, uh, a couple, couple of things. There's obviously, there's huge difference uh, a requirement of level of accuracy between diagnostic versus therapeutic, right? Therapeutic is no question there. Diagnostic, you're interested in those because of the potential risk, obviously. Uh, 
So uh, this is related with the field I'm working with, uh, which is epidemiological studies here. Uh, in this area, we are, we are living with uncertainties here and there because we are dealing with those reconstruction for the past event. In that case, uh, the more uncertainty you have, uh, risk tends to lower because of those uncertainties. So we are striving to uh, reduce uncertainty as much as we can in this case. But there are always limitation of data and uh, the, the, those related descriptors availability. So uh, for different application, the, the accuracy requirement should be different, I think. Okay, thank you very much for, for your answers. So I will assume, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, we are still not at all at the level of uh, making sure that patient-specific dosimetry is uh, routinely used, right? So there is still a way to go there, and there are a lot of challenges uh, that we have been uh, discussing and, and addressed. So I think that we are getting close to the, to, to the end. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy. We, I think that there are more than 20 questions. Some of them have been answered in the Q's and A's. And uh, I see that there was a number of uh, attendees in excess of 700, which is also very good. And, and really they match the, wow. the topic that was devised for this webinar. That is the, the challenges that are, are posed in these areas of, of medicine. So I, I'm, I'm very glad that it was a, an excellent uh, and, and very informative um, webinar. And, and I thank you, uh, all the participants. Uh, and of course, I will, uh, the speakers for their very good presentations. And, and of course, I, I, I get the word now to, to Madame Rayani for the, the final remarks and, and, and whatever information it's, uh, it's you want to, to provide. Thank you very much, Madame. Also. Thank you, Pedro, for your moderation of the webinar. Thanks to both the speakers, Jansip and Manuel, for very nice presentations and handling the questions. They nicely put up the answers to the question in the QA and box, and additionally supplemented by the oral response. Thanks to all the uh, participants from almost more than 90 countries. Uh, the time at this time is 4 a.m. at some place and 11 p.m. at another place. So it's a wide variation of time across the globe where the participants come from. And uh, we will provide certificate for those who uh, attend the uh, uh, webinar fully. Uh, this is the IMPW week, the International Medical Physics Week, and uh, organized both jointly by myself and the Vice President John Damilakis. And tomorrow's uh, presentation will be on radiotherapy topic. And I think I can share the screen to show the tomorrow's session. So tomorrow's webinar will be on Gen 4 medical physics applications. And then next day we will have the presentation by the on the virtual trials in breast imaging. And finally, on Friday, the RBE of uh, protons rather than it's time for change. So with that, I wish to thank each and every one of you once again. And thanks to Magdalena for the technical support for the webinars. And I wish you a wonderful rest of the day and hope to see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.